Welcome to Changing Higher Ed, a podcast dedicated to helping higher education leaders improve their institutions. With your host, Dr. Drum McNaughton, CEO of The Change Leader, a consultancy that helps higher ed leaders holistically transform their institutions. Learn more at changinghighered.com. And now, here's your host, Drum McNaughton. Thank you, David. Our guest today is Dr. Madeline Atkins, president of the Lucy Cavendish College at Cambridge University in the UK. Madeline's background is very diverse and includes public school teaching, various senior positions at Newcastle University, including Pro Vice Chancellor, Vice Chancellor at Coventry University, Chief Executive of the UK's Higher Education Funding Council, and now President at Lucy Cavendish. Madeline's passion is first generation students, and she joins us today to talk about what Lucy Cavendish is doing especially on how it's become the first Cambridge University college to reach the goal of admitting 90% of its fresher class from public institutions. Madeline, welcome to the show. Thank you very much for the invitation. It's a real privilege to be joining you today. Well, it's my privilege. Actually, you are my first guest on the show who's from outside of the U.S. And I'm really honored to have someone with your background, especially a woman rector, I believe that's the correct title, isn't it, rector? Uh, President, as it happens, but it comes to the same thing. Same thing, very good, well, thank you. The first woman president at Cambridge, so one of your colleges there, so congratulations to you and welcome. Thank you very much, it's an honor to be on the show, really looking forward to discussing some of the issues that we have in common across our two countries. Thank you. You know, I'm fascinated by your background. Give us, give the audience, if you would, just a little bit of how you you came into this position because it's it's very unusual. I mean, in the U.S., we're finding more and more women taking over the leads in colleges, but it's 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 not quite the same in the U.K. as I understand it. <laughs> So I started my professional life as a high school teacher. Indeed, I did a, a short spell uh, working in a school in Washington, D.C., even uh, in a bilingual school, which taught me a huge amount about education of young people aged 11 through 17, 18, I guess. Um, but I went and did a, a Ph.D. after I had done three, four years in high school. And my doctorate was on how young people from different minority backgrounds get tracked into different uh, avenues of progression beyond high school. And from there, I went into uh, higher education, into education department at a university, really committed to looking at what was happening in our schools and what we could do to improve the chances and indeed the achievements of students from certain groups. And that's been a passion, which I live right through to today. In the meantime, though, I have held a number of senior positions in universities. I've been a university president, and I've also worked for government as the regulator and funder of universities in England. And I did that for four years, taught me a lot about politics of education and policy making in education and higher education, particularly. And then from there, I was fortunate enough and very honored to be offered the presidency of Lucy Cavendish College. So here I am. Well, that is an incredible background. And I I do have to ask, bilingual education in, in Washington was that American English and British English or something else? No, I'm sorry. I couldn't, <laughs> I couldn't resist that one. <laughs> no, no. It was Latino, Spanish, and English. Very interesting because here in the U.S., there's so many more Latinos coming to university, and we actually have a designation over here, an HSI, a Hispanic Serving Institution. Fascinating. Yes, I can see how that has developed over the last, what, 10, 20 years? It must be at least in the U.S. Very interesting. Yes, it is. 
And now Cambridge is, well, what do you say about Cambridge? I mean, 800 years old, uh, the top university in the world. Uh, now you're admitting women. When did, when, did, when did you start admitting women there at Cambridge? Oh, 150 years ago. Okay. So you beat, you beat us again. <laughs> <laughs> well, we always like to say we educated John Harvard, you know. <laughs> this, and, and that's a good thing because you're still a better university, at least higher ranked. Than, than John <laughs> Harvard's university, isn't it? Uh, I don't think those comparisons are very helpful in the end. No. Uh, absolutely phenomenally great universities. Oh, absolutely. They, you know, you can pick the top 10, you can, you can pick the top 100 universities in the world, and they are all excellent. That is, that is such a neat thing about how universities transform individuals. Absolutely. And also by tackling some of the really difficult issues in our society, for humankind, for our planet, actually hopefully bringing forward positive change that we need to see. So yes, transforming people, transforming our societies and the things that we know are difficult to get right. And it's it's so important that these things happen. You, I couldn't have said it any better. What I'm really interested in, though, is at Lucy Cavendish, which is where, where you are, you're the first Cambridge College to admit over 90% of your first years from state schools. That's a big yes, change. That's, right. that's a big change. Historically for Cambridge, that's a huge change, yes. All the colleges have been trying to improve access for students from underrepresented or historically excluded groups, but we are by far and away the most diverse college in Cambridge, and we have by far and away the highest percentage of intake from government or state schools, uh, as we would call them. That is not unlike what we're doing here in the U.S. with many first-generation students and, and minority-serving institutions as well. Absolutely. But with this, you know, back in the 60s, you were mostly legacy admissions, were you not? So we were predominantly admitting from private schools at that time. Uh -huh. Absolutely, yes. And some private schools had tied places at Cambridge, so only students from those schools could take those places. That, of course, has now completely gone. That's very nice. And, you know, we, we're struggling with that here in the U.S. at many of the elite institutions is the legacy admissions type things. It's moving away from that. But without going into that too much, I think there's some lessons that can be learned by the U.S. institutions and vice versa for what you're doing over there, how it's working out, what you're doing to make sure that the students are successful when they get in. Because yes. the last thing you want to do is admit somebody and then they not be successful. Yeah, that's absolutely right. And one of the most important considerations, I think, in, in all of these issues. So we start pretty much with schools that don't have, high schools this is, uh, which don't have a great tradition or history of sending their pupils to the top schools, uh, to the top uh, universities in the UK, and where often these schools are in areas of considerable social or economic disadvantage. and. We know also from the U.S. That, that we have some similarities here. These are towns which used to have a manufacturing base, but that manufacturing has gone off to South Asia or East or Southeast Asia. Or they are coastal communities which have fallen economically behind the rest of the country for various reasons. Or indeed, they are from communities, high schools that serve communities that are minority ethnic, that are historically excluded often by tradition and history from universities. 
and cross sections of demographics um, across those things. So we start by looking for schools that fit those criteria and then really working with those schools, the teachers in those schools and the counsellors, as you would call them, to say, you've got very bright young people here. You've got great students. You've got students with potential. But how can we help you and them improve their grades? Because at the end of the day, the biggest problem for many of these young people is not getting the grades for the top universities. And so we talk to the high school teachers, they say, and the counselors about that. And we try and understand the background, the life that these young people are leading and how best, therefore, to support and give them more educational input. And that's been a learning curve for us. This may seem to some of your listeners and your followers very obvious, and maybe we have come to this realization late. But for example, many of these young people cannot really access the traditional ways that universities did outreach. They can't come to summer schools because they're looking after younger brothers and sisters or it's a single parent bringing them up and maybe the parent has a disability. The young person almost certainly has part-time job and that's essential for the family finances, particularly at the moment with rising cost of living. And so we had to start really by understanding much more deeply than we had before what actually works for these young people and how best to improve their grades by giving them online workshops that are challenging, stimulating, that take their schoolwork to another level. And that enables them then to get the grades of which they are capable, for which they have the potential, but were not uh, achieving those grades before because of all these other circumstances. So that's been the basis of our thinking. And of course, the circumstances vary across different parts of the UK. And we have tried to refine the program. This is a free online program. We know from research that a single intervention doesn't do a great deal of good to raise grades. So we're using research findings to shape that program. It's every fortnight. There's a workshop with academic subject teachers who understand both the school curriculum, the high school curriculum, and the university demands. And they lead, frankly, teaching sessions with these students online. They set work. They challenge them and stretch them intellectually and give them more materials, extension materials, and so on. And hearing, listening to the teachers, the high school teachers, one of the things they feel very frustrated about often is they don't have time really to give the attention to the brightest pupils that they've got. Their schools are in these very difficult neighborhoods. They have 101 pressures on them. They just don't have the capacity to put this extension and, and this challenge and this passion for the subject really into these young people's time. I think this is what you call your academic attainment program, is it not? Yes, it is. Yeah. Yes, it is. And so let's unpack some of that because you, what you're doing is, I think, very revolutionary. The first thing is identifying these students from backgrounds who would not normally attend college and you're not giving them, you know, hey, come to Cambridge. You know, we'll we'll take care of you here. You're you're driving their own academic achievement, their own academic attainment through these online seminars every fortnight, every two weeks. See, we even use Fortnite over here in the US from time to time. Uh, but you do this with them, and it's a repetition of getting them not only to raise their academic achievement, but I would also, and you didn't say this, but I would guess 
that it also gets them believing in themselves, thinking that, yes, I, I belong here. Absolutely right. And of course, they're drawn from 180 high schools across the country. Wow. So they are meeting people like themselves, similar backgrounds, but who also have a determination and a passion for the subject. And that is self-reinforcing for these young people. They may not have many others around them in their high school who have that kind of academic uh, approach or that academic desire. But in this way, they meet up every fortnight with lots of others who kind of share what they're trying to, to, to do. And I think that also gives them a sense that they're not alone, that it's fine to want to improve your grades. It's fine to enjoy history or physics or whatever it might be, and that you can engage with other people like yourself and learn and be exposed to more ideas and, and uh, have a great time, actually, yeah. intellectually and academically. And the other thing with that, the, that belonging piece is, you know, like you said, identifying with people around the country who do this, that's something that I have not heard. What I have heard over here in the States is affinity groups, you know, having groups at the universities to, you know, that what you're doing is getting that sense of belonging ahead of time so that they come in and they already have that sense versus having to be you know, for lack of a better word, convinced that they belong here. Sure. And we have a boot camp within the program roundabout now where we work with these young people on you know, which, which university, which course really is going to resonate with their ambitions. So they get some careers guidance there. And then we have a boot camp in the summer where we help them make the most competitive application to university that they can so that their application is looked at by the top universities and they get a fair chance of demonstrating what they can achieve, their potential, their, their enthusiasm, their passion, uh, what they can bring well, to the community. So th that's quite important too, that, that we have that, those kind of bookends around this program. So we're not just focusing necessarily on Cambridge or Oxford and Cambridge. It's uh, top universities. And so it's what course really will serve your career ambitions and what you've now find exciting uh, academically. Uh, but then also, how do you make the best possible application? Mm -hmm. I think that's really important. I want to come back to that. But before we get off of those online courses every fortnight, who teaches those? So we select teachers who are uh, fully qualified. They almost all have had experience both of teaching in high school and of teaching in a top university so that they understand the bridge between the sort of learning you get in high school and the demands of learning in a top university environment. So they are, uh, they are teachers. How do you fund this? Because this is, this is not inexpensive to do. No, you're right. We are very fortunate. We have philanthropists who are passionate about what we are trying to achieve, who agree and share our values and, and our mission here. And we have benefited from philanthropic funding. This is not funded by the university or by the state or by the government. Um, this is funded by philanthropy. That is really neat that you're able to find folks to do that. And I know there are quite a number of foundations here in the U.S. who would be willing to do the same type of thing. Sure. You've got some fabulous foundations that are kind of focused on these issues. Um, uh, and I'm sure that, that that would be a very a very rich theme to explore. And so moving on to the other end, the other bookend, getting these these potential freshmen ready for submitting the application, things along those lines. I also heard something, you know, said about like mini exams, you know, similar to what I think they were, maybe I've got it wrong. It's a minis. Help me out with that. I'm, I'm desperately trying to do that. Okay. Uh, drum. <laughs> well, so um, it is true that for entrance to Oxford 
Cambridge and some other um, of the top universities in the UK and for some subjects like medicine. Students, uh, applicants have to take some other tests before they come through for an interview. So part of what we do when we are working with these young people in the summer online, helping them put their application together, is actually to take them through the whole process, not just getting the documents in, but also then what kind of tests there might be and giving them some ideas about those and some practice and also talking to them about interviews and what an interviewer is looking for and giving them some mock interviews uh, for practice as well. So those, you're quite right, those are steps along the way. Mm -hmm. You're actually preparing them to be able to, not only to be able to do the work at the college level, to feel like they belong, but also to prepare them to be able to submit the applications to their desired colleges. I mean, so it's Absolutely. step one, step two, step three. It's not, oh, hey, we've got you here, so you know you're on your own now. There's nothing like that. No, I think that would be uh, that 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 would be pretty hopeless. Not least because for these schools, if they find that they encourage their students to come onto this kind of program. And then it doesn't work. The student doesn't get an offer from a, a good university or the university of their choice. It's very dispiriting. It's very demotivating for the high school teachers and counselors. They, they may well then feel it's not worth it. It's not worth the effort. So uh, we think it's very important for schools that have very little experience of putting students through and into this process that we, we, we work with the students every step of the way and we work closely with the teachers. Uh, and I, I suspect the working with the students, but especially working with the teachers and the counselors, so critical in this whole process. Yeah, absolutely. It's a partnership, mm -hmm. absolutely a partnership. So we've got these, they're no longer prospective students. They're incoming freshmen. Yep. There's got to be a process that they do. You you have your normal orientation when they get there. Sure. But for these students, you've got bridging week, I think is what it's called. Yeah, that's right. In fact, uh, we work through the summer before the, the fall when they're going to start as freshmen. We run online surgeries and Q&A sessions and, and all that sort of thing. I think many... I'm, lots and lots of, of universities do that, but it's important because it allows them to ask what might seem like dumb questions, but is worrying them. And they are a one in four of our intake are first in their family to go to university or college. So there's nothing much in the, the family background to draw on. So they are imagining all sorts of things about being at university, some of which is right, some of which is not and needs to be addressed. And then we bring them in, uh, we bring all our freshmen in for a week. It's indeed called Bridging Week. And we aim to do three things there. A lot of this is based on very good first-year experience programs in the States, which, which I've been familiar with for some time. So, so first of all, we want to show them that they are working at the level Cambridge requires. So we give them uh, a practice small group teaching session. We call those supervisions. In Oxford, they're called tutorials. It's the same thing. They actually do an essay or a problem sheet or whatever it is. They get feedback on it during that week. And at the end of the week, they know they are good enough for Cambridge and that the they are working at the level that is required. And that's because... Part of the imposter syndrome issue is the sense of, well, I was pretty bright at my school, but now I'm at Cambridge or Oxford or whatever. Oh, gosh, everybody around me is cleverer than I am. I'm going to have to work in my room 24-7 to justify my place. I'm not up to it. I'm going to let my family down or my school down. So we, we need to address that right up front about your academic ability and your ability to do the work to a standard that is absolutely fine. So that's number one. Um, number two, 
is what every university does, I think every college does, which is to get social networking going. Yep. So by the end of the week, they have worked in lots of different groups. They've met just about everybody. And they're beginning to find people that they want to, to be friends with. And you know, they cook together and they've gone out together and all of that stuff. The third thing, which may seem a little, a, a little strange, is that Cambridge, everybody imagines there's a kind of campus. And it's not like that at all. It's a city with... The university and the colleges threaded through it in all sorts of quite geographically complex ways. We want our students by the end of the week to know where they're going to have their lectures, to know where the lab is, to know where the libraries are, to know where the market is, to know where the discount supermarkets are, to know, yeah, so that they feel that they have agency, that they can find their way around, that they, they feel empowered yeah, to, to make Cambridge work for them. So that's really the third objective. Mm -hmm. I'm going to toss one other out there. Something that I have observed is every university, every college has their own traditions. They have their own language. <laughs> I will be willing to bet that there's a little bit of that that goes on in your bridging week. Sure. You're right. Yes. Like the word supervision, for example, has a specific meaning. In Cambridge, it's a, a small group session of one, two, three, or four students, maximum four students. It's uh, an essay. You have to do an essay for it every week, or you have to do a problem sheet or some other uh, piece of work, a case study. And people just toss these terms around. And for the student, it's quite bewildering. But I'll tell you something uh, which shows how, how, you know, how I, I get it wrong too a lot. We're a college that is outward facing, that prides itself on on having a broadly representative student body, representative of society. And we're not a Harry Potter college, if you know what I mean. <laughs> we don't have turrets and courtyards and staircases that move in the night and broomsticks or anything like that. That's, or owls. that's Oxford, right? Yeah, you got it. <laughs> um, <boom. laughs> and, and so... We have, you know, people sort of, um, I think quite a few students believe, you know, that that's going to be the environment they're going into. And it's not like that at Lucy Cavendish. And I, I, I suggested to the students that, you know, we don't have to wear gowns, you know, at, at formal meals if you don't want to. And they said, oh, no, no, Madeline, we really want to wear the gowns. <laughs> and we want to have candles on the, you know, on the, the dining room tables and so on. Uh, this is Cambridge. It's quite interesting, the, uh, the kind of um, the image of a place. And you have the sorting hat in your office, right? Oh, absolutely, I do. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> well, this, this is such an incredible program that you have put together. I know there's a lot of takeaways here for U.S. universities, and I'm sure vice versa as well. When we get off the recording today, I'm going to share, I've got a couple of contacts I'd like to share with you of universities Great. who are doing it really, really well over here. Oh, that would be brilliant. Really magic. Um, because it's a sharing that really helps to drive forward the innovation and, and uh -huh. gives one a different base for evaluating and refining and challenging ourselves uh how we can do this better mm -hmm. yeah the, the the two that i'll i'll share with you the contact information russell lowry hart at amarillo college it's a two-year institution over here but they have done just some incredible things and then Fabulous. the former dean of the rupe college which is part of loyola chicago yes Yes. And they have done some amazing things as well. And I'll share that contact information with you. That would be great because we're always interested in, in sharing good practice, in forming partnerships, in finding foundations and others that uh, other organizations that are keen to kind of take this agenda forward. So, yeah, that'll be first rate. Thank you. My pleasure. There's one other thing I wanted to ask you about because we're getting we're getting very close to the end of our time. I knew this was going to happen, and I'm so sorry. <laughs> you have a new initiative, collaboration with Queens College, and doing you know having U.S. students come over to partner 
So we are uh, in the in the stage of looking at that at the moment. It's not yet uh, operational, but obviously we hope that it will be so. This is City University in New York, which has, as people will know, on this uh, listening to this podcast, uh, a number of colleges, several of which serve boroughs which have ethnic minority, recent immigration, or first, second generation uh, immigrant communities. I think Queens claims it has the most diverse borough of, of any, probably mm-hmm. in the States. And that has many characteristics that are similar to the schools that we are working with. And we share a mission in a sense there. So yes, we've been very gracefully uh, received at Queens. We're hugely grateful for their hospitality and interest, and more generally with CUNY uh, overall. Mm-hmm. So when do you think this program will will formally kick off? So we're waiting as ever to see how the philanthropy comes in behind the scheme. The suggests, I think, where we will start and uh, with CUNY, and indeed we're delighted uh, to work with others, is round... Uh, the one-year master's programs, which, of course, in the UK, a master's program is just one year. In the States, it's normally two years. And as a college, Lucy Cavendish is very focused on bringing students from underrepresented communities all over the world in to our college to take uh, master's courses in the university, particularly those courses that are focused on the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. That's very much part of our mission. And we find that a a very diverse student body at the graduate level is a great learning group, an immersive living and learning experience for all of them. Uh, We have about 80, 80 countries represented at the master's level, and we seek to Well, we try and encourage students to work across disciplines uh, and particularly for the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. Most of those require a multidisciplinary approach to uh, find solutions that are practicable and implementable. That's very much our focus. And so we are seeking, again, philanthropic support because many of the students who will be future leaders in these communities and who have a lot from their background to contribute to understanding these issues and even more to finding ways that innovation can be implemented sustainably rather than just you know a project which happens for a couple of years and then fades away. For that, we need to, to bring students from low-income backgrounds, often low-income backgrounds in and across to Cambridge. And that's where we need the philanthropy, behind the fees. So let's have you back on the show. Once you've got it up and going, let's have you back and we'll talk more about this one. I'd Fantastic. love to. Fantastic. That would be a pleasure. So so as we always do, Madeline, we, we wrap up with, with two questions. The first of those being three takeaways for university presidents and boards. Oh, my goodness. It's... Um... I don't think uh, it, it <laughs> don't think it's my place to to give advice uh, in that way. What what I would say we have learned is uh, first to start with where the student is, rather than assume that historically we should go on doing exactly the same thing over and over again. I think the second thing we've learned is the data that. We really have to get high quality data and analyze it well so that we understand the trends, we understand the picture that's emerging and how it's changing. So 13-year-olds in high school are not the same as their 18-year-old elder brothers and sisters. You know, it will change. And the best way of handling that is probably by having great data sets and really interrogating them well. And I guess I'd say for us, the third thing has been learning from elsewhere, not least in our case, looking at great examples in the States and saying, for example, from the first year experience and saying, what is it here that's working fantastically well? How can we take and adapt it for our situation? Deliberately going outside the normal run of comparators to to look differently. at at, at completely different situations. Those are great takeaways. Thank you. 
So what's next for you? What's next for Lucy Cavendish? We are really focused now, as I said, on expanding graduate uh, student population from across the globe, including from the U.S., and driving further this attack, this addressing of the UN SDGs, United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. Cambridge is a world-class global university. We are focused on these difficult problems for humankind and the planet. We need a more diverse graduate population getting the skills, the advanced knowledge, the research, the leadership development, really to address those. So we are really looking for more uh, philanthropy and for more focus here on that agenda. Well, that's great. Madeline, thank you so much for being on the show. I've thoroughly enjoyed our conversation and I truly look forward to the next time we get a chance to talk. It's been a real pleasure and thank you so much for asking about Lucy Cavendish and our experience and I really look forward to further conversations with you with yourself um, and also with others in your higher education institutions. Very good. Thank you. And as as we would say across across that pond, cheers. <laughs> Indeed, cheers. <laughs> Thanks for listening this week, and a special thank you to Dr. Madeline Atkins, president of Lucy Cavendish College at Cambridge University in the UK, and for her sharing her insights on what Lucy Cavendish is doing to ensure their freshers are successful at Cambridge University. Tune in next week for my conversation with Dr. Olgan Sisek. Olgan's an expert in overseas higher education and quality assurance and will be sharing with us how U.S. higher ed institutions can build international enrollment through building overseas campuses. Until next week. Changing Higher Ed is a production of The Change Leader, a consultancy committed to transforming higher ed institutions. Find more information about this topic, along with show notes on this episode at changinghighered.com. If you've enjoyed this podcast, please subscribe to the show, and we would also value your honest rating and review. Email any questions, comments, or recommendations for topics or guests to podcast at changinghighered.com. Changing Higher Ed is produced and hosted by Dr. Drum McNaughton, post-production by David L. White.